Hello and welcome to this PV Tech Tech Talk Series webinar with PV Evolution Labs in partnership with DNV GL Energy. I'm Mark Osborne, the Senior News Editor at PV Tech and your moderator today. The title of this Tech Talk Series webinar is Top Performing PV Modules, the 2020 PV Module Reliability Scorecard. Our two key presenters are Tristan Arion Larico, Head of PV Module Business at PV Evolution Labs, also known as PEVEL, who will be giving an in-depth assessment of the key findings in this year's PV Module Reliability Scorecard report. Uh, for everyone's information, the report will also be made public for free download on PEVEL's website after this webinar. Tristan will then be followed by Dr. Dana Olson, Global Solar Segment Leader at DNV GL Energy. He will be providing an analysis of trends in PV module quality and we just discuss how Pebble's test data is used by DMVGL as part of its module useful life analysis. I will be concluding with a glimpse into PV Tech's own annual analysis of the report, mainly from the top performance category standpoint uh, in this presentation, but that will also appear in full on the PV Tech website. A quick reminder that we plan to have good time for Q&A after the presentations and viewers can send in any questions on this webinar platform throughout. But it does help us if you would uh, highlight at the beginning who the questions are addressed to. So whether that will be Pebble, DMV or PVTech, that would obviously help us greatly. Okay, uh, let's get started. And I'm very pleased to introduce our key presenter, Tristan from Pebble, to provide valuable insight into this year's PV Module Reliability Scorecard. Over to you, Tristan. Well, thank you, Mark, for that introduction. As you stated, my name is Tristan Irian Larico, and I am the head of PV Module Business at PV Evolution Labs, or PVEL. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I will discuss the 2020 PV Module Reliability Scorecard, which, are we, which we are releasing today. Normally, we release the scorecard at SNEC in Shanghai at this time of year, but uh, obviously, 2020 had different plans for all of us. We are, however, grateful to be using this webinar platform instead, and we're glad to see so many attendees joining us today. There's obviously lots of interest in the scorecard. Those who have seen it think this year's scorecard is our best edition yet, and I'm sure you'll agree. We're very excited to share it with you and the industry. But first, a short introduction. PVEL is the independent lab for the downstream solar market. We define downstream as entities such as developers, financiers, asset owners, o and EPC and insurance companies, and independent engineers. Basically, the companies who are on the buy side of the PV equipment transaction. PVAL assists these downstream entities by supplying data that accelerates the growth of solar and supports PV procurement transactions. Since our inception 10 years ago through today, we pioneered bankability testing for PV modules. We test for every aspect of a PV project, supporting over 400 worldwide downstream entities. Our test programs continuously evolve in response to market needs. One of those market needs is assisting our downstream partners to select reliable modules for their projects. When I started in this industry over 10 years ago, there were very few module and cell design choices. For crystalline modules, you could only choose three bus bar mono, or three bus bar poly, 60 cell or 72 cell. That was it. And even with those limited number of module designs, the task for selecting a module was difficult at that time. In this slide here, I've named the technology types we've tested for this year's scorecard. Quite a lot compared to the standard issue crystalline modules from 10 years ago. Also imagine the variations when a manufacturer combines some of these technologies with other materials in a module. That's a lot to keep track of from an ongoing quality perspective. With all of these changes in modules, there's also no long-term field data to consult when making procurement decisions. Relying on certification is also not a viable option as certification testing is not sufficient for 25 year or more lifetime of solar projects. Relying on module warranties is also not recommended due to a number of shortcomings that are detailed in the scorecard. So how does one select reliable PV modules? 
Well, that's the question we are solving with our product qualification program, or PQP. We launched the module PQP in 2012 with two goals. First, to provide the necessary due diligence data to the downstream. And second, to provide third-party recognition to module manufacturers who are producing reliable products. As shown on the screen, one key aspect to the PQP is that the sample modules that get shipped to PVAL are factory witnessed during production, which is a gating step for every PQP that we test. Our auditors follow a multi-step approach to ensure the bill of materials or BOM being used in the modules we receive has been verified and recorded in detail. This is then included in our PQP factory witness reports and from there, it can be extracted into BOM exhibits that are provided to the downstream free of charge for use in their procurement contracts. Specifying the exact BOM or BOMs that did well in PQP testing is one of our key recommended procurement best practices, which I'll talk about a little later. Before we move on from this topic, though, it's worth mentioning that we also have PQPs for inverters and energy storage. Another principle of the PQP is that it's updated annually to provide module buyers with consistently relevant data as new technologies and or manufacturing techniques are introduced. These updates are in response to feedback from the market, including downstream buyers, asset owners, financiers, independent engineers, as well as module manufacturers and independent research institutions. In August 2019, PVAL released the most significant update in the history of the PQP. That updated test plan is what's shown on the screen. Changes to the program include new tests for backsheet durability, light and elevated temperature induced degradation, or LETID as it's known, and mechanical stress. Because PVAL's new tests were introduced midway through 2019, the top performers for these new tests are not ranked in the 2020 scorecard. Instead, we included case studies for the bag sheet durability sequence and our LETID test. I'll talk more about these case studies in a few minutes as well. So that brings us to this year's scorecard. As shown, this is the sixth edition and it is now available for download at www.pvel.com slash pv scorecard. We've worked hard to make it this year's, to make this year's the most informative scorecard to date and we're eager for all of you to read it and share it with your colleagues. While I certainly can't cover all of the scorecards topics within this webinar, over the next few slides, I will take a look at some of the insights gained, contained in this year's edition. First off, one of our key findings is that potential induced degradation remains a concern and is certainly not a solved problem, as many in the industry believe. In fact, the median PID degradation result was higher for testing conducted for the 2020 scorecard than at any time in PVAL's 10-year history. When PVAL's testing uncovered PID issues, the module manufacturers typically responded with surprise, having thought their modules to be PID resistant. While not a concern for utility scale sites employing central inverters equipped with negative system grounding, power loss attributed to PID can significantly diminish module performance at sites with transformerless inverters, which are electrically ungrounded. Deploying PID susceptible modules at those sites can have significant financial impacts for the site owners. Another key finding presented in the scorecard is that damp heat remains a relevant test for identifying underperforming bombs. This can be seen in the example images here, where the module performed well to the 1000 hour IEC 61215 damp heat test duration with less than 2% degradation after 1000 hours, this module passed IEC certification without issue. It is only after extending this to P the PQP's test duration of 2000 hours where we see issues emerge. Corrosion can be seen along the bus bars and edges of the cells and the power degradation surpassed 9%. Deploying this module in environments with high temperatures and high humidity, such as tropical or subtropical regions, may lead to significant performance issues. For the first time, we are including the module's modeled energy yield as a top performer category. We do this through our pan file testing, 
where we flash three identical modules of the same bomb across a matrix of operating conditions per IEC 61853-1. These range in a radiance from 100 to 1100 watts per meter square and range in temperature from 15 degrees to 75 degrees Celsius. A custom pan file is then created with PVSYS parameters optimized for close agreement between PVSYS model results and PVAL's measurements across all of the different test conditions. To better illustrate performance from optimized pan files, each PVAL pan report includes two site simulation results, a one megawatt site in a desert climate at a 20 degree tilt in Las Vegas, USA, and a one megawatt site in a temperate climate at zero degree tilt in Boston, USA. Top performers listed in the scorecard are module types whose PVSYS simulations for Las Vegas or Boston resulted in an energy yield within the top quartile of all eligible results. This top quartile threshold is shown as the dashed lines in the histograms presented here. By including the PAN performance historical data, you can clearly see the performance improvements in the 2020 scorecard PAN data set. Module energy yield is clearly increasing with improved module designs. In fact, of PVAL's historical data from all PQPs since 2016, only 4% of modules tested would receive a 2020 scorecard top performer designation. This year's scorecard also features key takeaways for bifacial modules. With about a quarter of tested bombs being bifacial, we had a lot of bifacial data to share with the industry. The first somewhat obvious insight is that bifacial modules dominated the PAN top performer listings. You could see that in the bimodal, distri bimodal distributions on the PAN graphs from the last slide. The second set of distributions on the higher end of the energy yield all relate to bifacial modules. And clearly that shows us the step function performance increase associated with that module technology. With no inverter clipping, the median energy yield for, for of all the Las Vegas sites with bifacial modules was 7.7% higher than that of the monofacial sites. At the horizontal tilt site in Boston, the median bifacial energy yield was 3.3% higher than the monofacial median. Some notable bifacial results from other top performer categories include that both glass glass and glass back sheet bifacial modules achieve top performer status for thermal cycling. Thus far in PVAL's thermal cycling testing, the amounts of front side and rear side power degradation are aligned. Despite it being well documented that glass glass modules have performed poorly in damp heat testing in the past, the newer bifacial glass glass and glass back sheet combinations we have tested show similar damp heat performance in PVAL's PQP. This is likely due to the move from an encapsulant based on EVA to polyolefin or PoE in glass glass modules. Both bifacial and monofacial modules show similar performance results following our DML sequence. We have over 20 bifacial bombs queued up for the new mechanical stress sequence. We predict that this test will provide some strong differentiation across these various bifacial designs and we're very eager to share the data with the industry later this year. Finally, we see a range of bifacial results in our PID testing. In some cases, we measured very high rear side degradation, up to 30%. It is possible that some of this rear side degradation is due to a reversible polarization effect that can occur in bifacial modules during PID testing, but not all P-type bifacial modules are susceptible to this phenomenon. Moving over to look at failures during our testing. There are three types of failures in the PQP. First is safety. Safe operation is determined via wet leakage testing using the IEC 61215 standard, which evaluates the electrical insulation of the PV module under wet operating conditions. Failure means that module operation may be hazardous in the field. Second, visual inspection. Modules are examined for delamination, corrosion, broken or cracked surfaces, and other changes to the module using the 61215 criteria. Failure here indicates that 
major manufacturing defects are present, leading to premature failure in the field. And third, power degradation. Although the PQP does not assign specific pass-fail thresholds for degradation, module manufacturers are able to remove their products from testing if the power loss falls below expectations. In these cases, manufacturers usually change their bomb or production process, then submit new samples for retesting. PVAL notes all retests in PQP reports for full transparency with downstream buyers. Failure in this case means the modules may underperform in the field and ultimately result in financial losses for the asset owner. With 20% of eligible bombs for the 2020 scorecard having at least one failure, PVAL is observing a resurgence of known failure mechanisms. Additionally, one in five manufacturers had at least one junction box related failure, either related to wet leakage failures that were traced to the junction box or one or more diodes failing following thermal cycling. Correct placement of the junction box lid and application of sealants are critical manufacturing processes. Selecting robust bypass diodes and implementing strong electrostatic discharge controls on the junction box or module production line is essential to module reliability. But these things can be overlooked in the pursuit of production targets, leading to the failures we've observed in our testing shown in the image on the right. In the field, some site owners have experienced catastrophic failures related to module junction boxes, an example shown in the image on the left. In addition to the top performer results, we also included in this year's scorecard some case studies. I've included some examples here. As you can see, they are full of valuable information and tie various in-field issues with PVAL's in-lab test results. We provide context into reliability issues in the field and show how consulting a top tier list is not a su sufficient practice for module selection due diligence. In our backsheet durability sequence, we show how the backsheet cracks that are affecting site performance and site safety are caught via our new backsheet durability sequence. And in our LETID case study, we highlight a site where a change in cell within the same module model resulted in LETID related power loss of up to 7.5%. We also show how a manufacturer who claims that they are LETID free had a fairly wide range of results across two different module types. With our new backsheet durability and LETID tests as part of the updated PQP, we will be able to help the industry avoid these issues. Not shown here is another case study we feature that provides insight into how changing the module factory can impact module performance. You'll have to check that out in the scorecard. The historical scorecard shows the list of 2020 top performers and their history of top performance in past scorecards. PVAL, DMVGL, and myself personally would like to congratulate all of the manufacturers listed here. They should all be commended for achieving this status as we have many examples of bombs that did not do well in testing that are also commercially available in the market today. In the historical scorecard, manufacturers are listed by the number of years they have been designated a top performer in alphabetical order. Through continued top performance, manufacturers show their strong commitment to product quality and reliability. Download the scorecard to see which module types from each of these manufacturers were top performers in the five different test categories. And keep in mind that although we report top performing models in the five test categories, we test at the bomb level. It's important to contact PVEL to learn which bomb or bombs did well in testing, as manufacturers could have many bombs, some tested, some not, under a single model number. While the scorecard is a great tool to educate the industry on some of the risks involved in module procurement and highlight the top performers, it is important to conduct verification activities throughout the stages of procurement, construction, and operation. PVAL recommends these best practices. The first is verification before production. Obviously, we encourage downstream buyers to require PQP testing as part of the module selection process. Buyers should ensure that the products they are buying achieve satisfactory PQP results when benchmarked to other products on the market. As I mentioned earlier, PVAL provides the downstream with complementary bomb exhibits that include 
detailed listings of the components of the exact modules we've tested and reported in the scorecard. These are used to specify the PQP tested BOM in supply agreements. Further, PVAL works with third party auditors to complete detailed factory audits, which are separate from the PQP factory witness. These detailed audits ensure that the factory is manufacturing to industry best practices, and many developers and investors require them. Next, to the manufacturing process. PVAL again works with third party factory auditors to ensure that the bomb specified in the procurement contract is in fact the bomb used during production. Factory oversight also ensures manufacturers are following their documented procedures and that any previous audit findings have been resolved. Many developers and investors require this factory supervision while their modules are being made. We also offer a variety of batch testing options to mitigate risk. This takes modules from various production batches that are destined for the project site and reroutes them to PVAL for testing. Reliability-based batch testing shows manufacturer consistency across a relatively large sample size. Performance testing per batch provides higher confidence in the performance data and the most accurate performance modeling inputs. Inverter factory acceptance testing is also a key best practice that we strongly recommend. And finally, PVAL offers a suite of field testing services. Our capacity testing verifies that the site was built and commissioned correctly through precise performance measurements using lab quality measurement devices deployed in the field. Completing baseline field EL imaging results in obtaining crucial data that should the site ever experience extreme weather, which is becoming all too common these days. This data will develop the baseline for insurance claims where the project owner can clearly show the quality of the modules before the weather event. It can also demonstrate whether or not module damage occurred during installation, something that could be covered during the typically relatively short EPC warranty period. So to conclude, a quick reminder that you can access the full scorecard at pval.com. Thank you for your attention, and I definitely look forward to your questions. If we don't get to all of them, please don't hesitate to contact us. Now back to Mark. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, a lot of uh, excellent data and some uh, thoughtful stuff to cover. Uh, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions for you uh, very shortly. Uh, thank you again, Tristan. Uh, our next presenter is uh, Dr. Dana Olson from DNV. Uh, Dana, if you're ready, uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Mark. Okay, so uh, my name is uh, Dana Olson. I'm the global segment, uh, solar segment leader here at DNVGL Energy. And I'm going to follow up on some of what uh, Tristan has presented thus far and give a little bit of context from um, our perspective as an IE serving the solar industry. Um, in specifically, I'm going to discuss uh, the analysis of uh, some of the historical PQP module uh, test data. Uh, as well as how we use this data uh, in understanding how to extend uh, the useful life of PV systems. So a brief uh, introduction to DNVGL uh, and our solar business. Uh, we're looking at uh, now over 25 years of experience in the solar industry to help investors, uh, project developers, system owners, utilities, as well as equipment manufacturers in developing high-performing and reliable uh, PV systems. Uh, we've supported now over 7,000 projects worldwide from residential to utility scale. And in 2016, Dean VGL acquired Green Power Monitor, a global solar monitoring company uh, founded in 2006 in Barcelona, Spain. And GPM, um, is now um, monitoring 24 gigawatts of solar capacity, uh, many of which are well over 100 megawatts in size uh, each. That gives us uh, a global perspective and expertise across the solar PV project lifecycle, uh, enabling uh, feasibility studies, um, technical due diligence, uh, des uh, design reviews, uh, to all the way to financing and operation. Um, we're leaning heavily into uh, coordination with Green Power Monitor, especially on the operational side, and to understand how a lot of the decisions that are being made 
um, during procurement and design are actually leading to performance in the field. With that, I'll jump into the analysis. Um, so DNVGL has analyzed uh, the PVAL PQP test results from uh, 2014 to present. And um, while the PQP, as Tristan laid out, is continually evolving over time, uh, the thermal cycling and damp heat tests have remained quite common uh, during the, uh, this, this time cycle. And based on that, we're seeing some statistically significant trends that I'll talk about here today. Um, and I want to acknowledge as well that uh, all of the analysis herein was uh, done by Henry Hisselmeyer, uh, who's our principal engineer on solar technology focused on PV modules. So with that, we'll first start with uh, trends in thermal cycling. Uh, this is an analysis of TC600 testing, so 600 cycles of thermal cycling, um, and the results therein across all bombs reviewed from 2014 to 2017. This was uh, across about, in this case, about 336 modules or, or bombs. And what you can see here is that uh, the TC600 results have improved uh, statistically over the last um, several years. And in fact, from 2014 to 2017, there was a pretty substantial improvement in the performance of uh, these modules with regards to thermal cycling. And since 2017, we've seen more or less a, a plateau of, uh, of that performance without any significant changes therein. Uh, this is encouraging in the sense that um, while the module costs over the past five years have gone down uh, dramatically, uh, the quality with regards to mechanical testing, um, or pardon me, thermal cycling in, in this case is, um, is, is holding very well. Uh, this improvement may be explained by a transition to monocrystalline cells and uh, monocrystalline uh, module technologies, um, as well as an increase in the number of bus bars that has occurred over this time, as well as thicker encapsulants, which, uh, which help mitigate some of those uh, thermal cycling um, and uh, mismatch events across interfaces. With that, we'll move to trends in damp heat. Uh, damp heat testing uh, here has also been included over the course of the last five years. So this is a damp heat 2000 results uh, showing that uh, in fact, since 2015, there has in fact been a deteriorating trend in the, in the performance and the reliability of those systems uh, to hold up to DMP2000 testing. So this, we believe, um, is statistically significant over the last few years uh, and has been uh, tested over the course of about 430 modules or different bombs. And uh, we believe that this may be due to the adoption of PERC technologies which may require an additional boron oxygen uh, LID stabilization step after that damp heat test uh, to mitigate the, the losses. In fact, um, this is highlighted in the 2020 scorecard. And um, in, in many cases, uh, PVEL has gone back and, and done that stabilization step as well to understand what um, the recovery can be. That said, um, this is certainly a trend um, you know, toward, uh, say, decreasing uh, reliability in terms of damp heat testing. Tristan uh, highlighted that earlier. And this may reflect the utilization of non-floor polymer back sheets or thinner screen printed fingers, which may be more sensitive to corrosion um, and moisture ingress into the, the module bomb. The other thing I want to highlight as well is um, the idea of ideal test durations. Uh, so, you know, these, these tests are a careful consideration of a whole host of things in terms of how long uh, we want to be able to test these things, how quickly we can get through these tests as well. And uh, the ideal test durations, as you might expect, are often debated. Um, these tests are meant to simulate stresses and degradation mechanisms that occur in the field. Uh, so we're not just testing for you know, the heck of it. And in fact, in many cases, the tests in the PQP are more extensive than, than what the IEC uh, certifications um, or standards require. So if the test duration is too short, uh, the degradation mechanism may not be detected. 
Um, on the other hand, if the duration is too long, then new non-representative failure mechanisms could be introduced um, that you wouldn't actually see in the field. Um, so these are, it's a fine balance, I think, between these two. And what we're trying to do here is look at um, how these, um, these tests actually relate in terms of extending that duration or cycles. So in this case, uh, I'm showing the thermal cycling tests and the correlation between 200 and 600 cycles. Here showing that there are no new mechanisms that are introduced by the 600 cycle tests relative to 200. However, uh, the R squared value of 0.6 here shows that the, the data, or pardon me, stopping the data at 200 cycles may be premature in terms of it is not an exact replication of what is going on at uh, 200 cycles to what we're seeing at 600 cycles. On the other hand, reviewing the historical 600 cycle data versus 800 cycles, uh, we've previously seen that the correlation indicates that uh, 600 cycles is sufficient test duration with very good agreement and a higher R squared value. Looking at damp heat testing, uh, here I'm showing a correlation between 1,000 hours and 2,000 hours. And just as uh, Tristan highlighted earlier in, in the webinar, uh, 1,000 hours is not adequate substitute for 2,000 hours. And in fact, here you can see that the R squared uh, value is uh, only 0.4, uh, showing that there's a fair amount of disagreement between those two tests still. Um, and what we're seeing is the DAMP heat 2000 is more representative of some of the failures that are being observed in the field. And that's highlighted, I think, in the scorecard as well. Um, and while the historical correlation between 2000 and 3000 hours uh, indicates uh, that there is actually less relevant failure mechanisms that may be introduced um, by testing at 3000 hours, um, that's to say that uh, the the 2000 hour damp heat test is optimal and in fact re representative of what is being seen in the field. So with that, I'd like to just uh, lead into the next topic, which is using PVELS data in uh, DNVGL's useful life ana analysis and assessments. So the industry is uh, keen on extending system life beyond 25 years. Um, and DNVGL determines the module useful life by considering the failure rates of the modules uh, through the course of a, a number of tests and um, uh, analyses. So we define a failure as um, a significant drop in module power in a short period of time. And examples of this would include uh, PID, uh, corrosion, and failed backsheets, all of which are, are called out um, in, the, in the PQP scenario, as well as in this year's uh, module scorecard. So based on that, we're doing useful life assessments based on um, module quality. And what we're trying to do is, ex is work with uh, the industry and, and uh, customers to extend and develop scenarios to extend the useful life uh, to 30 to 40 years. Uh, the motivation, of course, is relatively straightforward. It uh, lower, lowers the levelized cost of electricity uh, by 16 to 20% and increases the asset value. Uh, however, system components require quality improvements and or replacement over time. And what we're kind of highlighting here on the right is that uh, components and systems need to demonstrate other lower failure rates and or degradation rates in order to extend that useful life. So on the right, you can see here that there's uh, two curves for uh, low and high degradation respectively. And you can see quite uh, clearly that um, having a lower degradation rate helps you extend the system life. Or um, alternatively, or in concurrence, you can uh, actually work as well into the module replacement costs. So you can have low or high failure rates as well and understand how to best design a system um, over the course of the life cycle to maximize the value and um, output. Uh, this is, uh, includes obviously module replacement costs, which we're discussing here but also inverter replacement costs and, and other uh, balance of systems as well. So with that, um, DNVGL has developed a three-tier module classification. 
that we're working on um, based on uh, the need to uh, for the industry to develop extended useful life systems. And uh, those include uh, classifications of standard quality and high durability modules and components. And with the associated failure rates and replacement schedules um, that fit those definitions. So P PVL's PQP enables module classification through an extensive suite of accelerated tests, um, as is outlined in the scorecard. And um, additional classifications that help us make these uh, considerations include uh, factory audit reports, uh, the detailed bomb review, and historical field data. So targeting a system life of 40 years would entail that almost all of standard modules would need to be replaced by the end of that uh, useful life of the system. So you can see that here in the green line, that this is the cumulative modules, number of modules replaced or percentage replaced uh, over the course of that uh, life cycle. Whereas only 40% and 6% of the quality and high durability modules would need to be replaced respectively. And what we can see here is that um, module quality and uh, accelerated testing is actually of very high importance, especially for new technologies where we don't have an extensive amount of field data um, to understand what the, what the relative uh, performance of those components will be over time. So just to, to summarize, um, we, we see uh, for certain that PVEL's carefully designed PQP tests provide the data the industry needs to extend the useful life of PV systems and thereby reduce um, the levelized cost of electricity. So with that, I'll say thank you and we'll hand it over to Mark. Well, thank you, uh, Dana, uh, much appreciate on this insight. So we're, we're getting close to the Q&A session, but uh, I will now conclude just with a quick glimpse into PV Tech's uh, own analysis uh, that we've been doing on a, an annual basis in relation to the PV module reliability scorecard. It's fascinating data, and uh, we're gonna just focus here uh, on the top performer parameters uh, that are not featured in the report, uh, which will also be on PV Tech's website after, after this uh, webinar in one of my uh, editor's blogs. Now, the first slide, um, this is a compilation of all PV module manufacturers in the test this year that have successfully achieved top performer status in any of the historical four key module reliability testing regimes. Now, uh, Pevel, I'm mentioning this because Pevel has actually included a fifth test with the pan files uh, for the performance of modules, and we're not really covering uh, that aspect here today. Uh, I also must stress that uh, uh, that uh, not all of the manufacturers uh, that participate in these uh, really rigorous uh, testing regimes necessarily uh, want to be included in the public report, um, but also uh, it should be noted that at this time, uh, some of the tests have not been fully completed for some of the manufacturers that are actually listed here. So uh, you have to understand that uh, uh, some of these figures are still, uh, or some of the testing is still ongoing and will be updated uh, later. But we've had to take that analysis, obviously, from the report that is uh, going to be in the public domain. Uh, now, that said, uh, regardless of the number of top performers, uh, which of course this year is, there's 22 manufacturers, they're all top performers. Uh, doesn't matter about uh, from one to the plus 20 that you see from the, the left-hand side uh, of the table to the right. Now, one of the things that uh, we recognize is that uh, companies uh, also have different modules. Uh, some companies do a lot more testing with a range of modules than others. And uh, with the second slide here, uh, this gives you a better uh, understanding uh, of what this analysis is all about. And again, we put this in the ranking uh, format, uh, but also included here on the right-hand side column, that the number of uh, different modules 
that were tested that received uh, a top performer category. And then you see it in the middle range, uh, it's quite consistent where companies have maybe four, uh, two to four, is that they're getting uh, six to eight uh, types of uh, uh, top performer status. Uh, but also if you look uh, right further down on the left, just past the halfway mark, I'll just pick out uh, REC group there. Uh, clearly in the report, uh, there was one module that was tested, but it actually achieved uh, four of the uh, historical reliability uh, top performer awards. And this leads very importantly uh, to the next slide that uh, really is like the, the cream of the crop, shall we say, in, in the uh, traditional methods here, the four typical historical reliability tests. So REC group uh, basically did a clean sweep uh, of the historical reliability side uh, with their uh, Twin Peaks 2 uh, module, just in case uh, people uh, don't recognize straight away the, uh, the REC part number uh, for, the, for that product. But uh, if we step one, one up, uh, Longi Solar achieved a clean sweep in the reliability tests uh, with their uh, HIMO-1 uh, mono perk module. Uh, Silfab, uh, based in the US, uh, probably one of the smaller companies uh, in, in this testing, actually uh, got a clean sweep in uh, two, two modules, both uh, mono perk. But here we come to uh, the key company, I guess, uh, that uh, uh, really sort of highlights uh, what can be achieved. Uh, so uh, with what we have here is that uh, as, uh, Astrology, uh, which had uh, uh, six modules in for the full testing uh, with Pebble this year, four of these got a clean sweep in all of the uh, four reliability testing scores, uh, which is uh, a, a, a very a very impressive uh, uh, thing task to do. But I've just added in as well, the new PAN file analysis to, uh, that's in the report, which kind of further highlights that, uh, you know, uh, astrology have just edged away from everybody else because they actually were a top performer in that new class as, as well. And then uh, lastly, uh, I just want to pick up on uh, one of the more technical issues to do with the report, um, because basically uh, this last, the dynamic mechanical load test uh, basically highlighted the smallest number of modules that achieve top performer scores. So this was uh, a very tough, this year was a very tough test uh, 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 to pass. And again, not all of the companies have had this test done yet, but uh, it seemed to be an interesting one to pick out. Uh, and actually there was uh, uh, only eight companies uh, achieving uh, the uh, 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 top performer category from 19 different modules. I think it also uh, should be noted that uh, many modules in the uh, full reliability testing regime uh, could, have, could have been included uh, in a clean sweep if it wasn't for the fact that they, uh, they didn't meet the criteria to get a top performer award uh, under the DML test. So, okay, I'm done with uh, my side of it. That's the end of my presentation. And now we'd, uh, we'd like to open uh, the uh, webinar to the final Q&A session of this PB Tech, uh, Tech Talk series webinar with P uh, Pevel and DNV. And uh, we've got a lot of questions here uh, waiting in line. Maybe this one for Tristan. Uh, what's, the, what's different about the PB Tech's rankings and the actual scorecard report? Ah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Good question. So our scorecard is based on laboratory test results from PVAL and from the product qualification program. Um, people familiar with the PV Tech quarterly rankings, uh, those are, are focused on commercial, financial, and high-level technology aspects of the different manufacturers. 
including things such as their research and development spending, et cetera, it's, it doesn't take into account test results. So we feel like both of those uh, complement each other nicely. Okay, that's great. Maybe one here for, for Dana. When a product fails, uh, does DNV also provide suggestions, changes required uh, to a manufacturer? Um, yes, I mean, based on uh, the, the performance of these, uh, these modules during the, the extended uh, PQP testing, uh, certainly we can provide uh, insights and, and some um, recommendations on, on how to improve uh, module quality and reduce failures. Um, you know, when they fail in the field, um, we obviously um, we can do a, a fair bit of uh, reconnaissance and understand uh, root cause analysis and things along those lines as well. And uh, that's supported by, by many um, in the industry um, as well. Okay, great. Thank, thanks, Dana. Uh, back to you, Tristan, on this, because uh, I'm kind of summarizing uh, various uh, questions here. But there's a, a general theme here uh, of how should buyers use the scorecard? Yeah, so we we like to say that uh, the scorecard does rank top performers, but it's not a shopping list. It's a guide to understand PV module degradation, reliability, performance. It describes the testing we're doing. It, it shows how it compares to different field failures and then highlights which, which modules are performing well. Um, but buyers should always consult the full BOM reports because our, our testing reports are based on a bill of material level. And PVAL provides these reports to, the, to our downstream partners on a complimentary basis. There's, there's no cost for those. Uh, so the scorecard lists only the model number, but not the specific BOMs that performed well. And as I said in the presentation, you know, uh, a, a model number may be made up of multiple different bomb combinations. Some might be tested, some might not be. So getting access to that bomb is, is critical. Okay, understood. Uh, there's been lots of questions about uh, uh, PID, uh, but also LATID. Maybe I can summarize on the LATID side here. Uh, what has Pebble actually observed so far uh, in regards to LATID testing? Because obviously this is one of the new features that uh, is going to come through next year. Yeah, so we've done a lot of LETID testing as part of um, PQPs, as well as batch testing for downstream clients. And we highlight some of those results in the scorecard. Um, we've seen, for the most part, uh, fairly good results from the manufacturers we've tested with a median degradation as well as a, an average degradation up at about 1%. So not, not huge amounts of degradation and it seems like for the majority of manufacturers we've tested, LETID is under control. Uh, yet there are cases like the one we highlight in the scorecard LETID case study where we see different results on, on the different module types from the same manufacturer, where one manufacturer has, or sorry, one model type has very little degradation and the other one had, uh, I believe over 3% degradation. So um, again, it's really important to consult those reports and, and look at the data on, on the bomb level. Okay, great. Uh I guess that leads into another one here really about, uh, you know, how, I mean, obviously we've all understood the rapid development of uh, new uh, modules, uh, introduction of new technology, but how has the module quality changed over time? Yeah, maybe that's one Dana can, can touch upon. Yeah, um, sure. I mean, we've sorry. looked at uh, a a whole host of uh, the, the testing that, that's been included as part of the, the PQP uh, efforts at, at PIVO. And um, it, it's clear that uh, there are some uh, trends that I highlighted in the, the webinar here today and, and is in the scorecard as well, um, where we see improvements and we see in other cases uh, things deteriorating, in, in especially with regards to damp heat. Um, and, and PID, I think, as uh, Tristan pointed out this year. 
Um, I think what's interesting is that, yeah, while uh, module prices have gone down precipitously over the last uh, 10 years, uh, there's uh, been no substantial impacts to, I would say, module quality, although, you know, we're keeping our eye on things. And, um, you know, we catch things, I think, through these tests that uh, do prevent those modules from um, you know, getting out into the, the commercial um, uh, space, right? So to some extent, without accelerated testing uh, protocols like this, um, you wouldn't have any idea how a, a module or a new bomb or material might perform. And I think this is uh, one of the best ways to help mitigate those those challenges. Got it. Thank yeah, you. I would, just to add on that too, in the scorecard, we provide the historical results for yep. all of the five different tests. So that helps you kind of benchmark how the 2020 data set compares to our historical results. Um, so look out for that in the scorecard too to see that comparison. Yeah, got it, thank you. Obviously, the one of the, the other new tests uh, is obviously on the uh, back sheet durability. And I think I'm trying to link this as well to lots of questions about rear side uh, PID uh, issues uh, with bifacial modules. But uh, and obviously the glass, glass to uh, glass back sheet. But what can you what can you give us on uh, on understanding some of this, especially on the uh, the new back sheet durability testing? Yeah, so I guess there's two different things. There is the bifacial PID testing, which I, I can touch on, or bifacial PID results, as well as the uh, the back sheet testing. So last year we introduced the backsheet durability sequence to the PQP. Uh, we didn't have enough results. It's, it's a fairly long test because we're trying to replicate 25 years of outdoor exposure on these backsheets. Um, we didn't have enough results to make it a scorecard top performer category, but we did have enough results to do a case study in the scorecard. And what you can see there is that, of course, um, there's an, a number of backsheets failing in the field, and we highlight an example of that. And then in our in our own testing, we see a range of issues affecting backsheet durability and reliability. Um, I don't think we have a clear conclusion yet on whether clear backsheets versus white backsheets, if, if clear backsheets present a higher risk. We've certainly done this test on clear backsheets and seen good results. And we have a number of other clear backsheet types going through the test now. And it'll be a few more months before we see if there's any issues related to that. Um, but again, important to contact us, get, get access to those reports, and demand that if you're buying modules, those go through PQP testing so you have that uh, backsheet durability data before you install the modules and then find out in five or 10 years from now that they all start cracking open and you have this huge issue in multiple megawatts that need to be replaced like some system owners have right now. On the other side of the coin is the PID testing. Um, we have seen similar um, PID rear side degradation for glass, glass, and glass backsheet modules. In some cases, that degradation is very low on the rear side. In other cases, it's quite significant on the rear side. So I don't think that a glass glass package versus a glass backsheet package solves the, the PID issue on the rear side for, for bifacial modules. There is some research to show that that is a, a test artifact and that it's something that wouldn't occur in the field. It's a reversible polarization effect. Um, but like I said earlier, we see it on some modules and not others. So it, it needs further research and exploring. Lots of people hear this uh, interaction with, uh, obviously, uh, with the uh, dynamic uh, mechanical loading side. Uh, maybe just give us some understanding because people are concerned about we're going we're getting to larger wafers that create larger modules. Uh, lots of companies are introducing 500 watt plus modules, some with 78 cells in them instead of the for, for utility scale 72. What what can you tell us about uh, 
sort of reliability from from a size perspective perspective just from say a 60 cell standard traditional 60 cell to some of these more advanced modules which are much larger yeah we haven't seen a significant amount of concern with with traditional 72 cell modules or even the you know 166 millimeter cell modules we're we're not seeing that as you know, a red flag affecting all manufacturers producing that larger size. Um, we do see that some perform better than others. And, and again, you got to drill down to the bomb level to see, you know, what kind of wafer thickness they're using, what encapsulant thickness they're using, what's their frame design, and how is it strengthening the modules. There's lots of details that go into it beyond just this module is larger than that one. Um, in terms of these larger modules, uh, even larger than the 166, I see a lot of questions coming up with those. Those are just starting to arrive at the lab, these 500 watt plus modules. So certainly in the coming months, we'll, we'll have more and more data on, those perf on the performance of those. But as you can imagine, you know, they're, they're very new. These press releases are coming out right now from manufacturers on these larger sizes. So it takes a bit of time from when they're announced to when they're ready for third party testing. And, and we're just getting those uh, into the lab now. Okay, understood. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, those results. Yeah, on, uh, me too. <laughs> um, maybe uh, just looking at the time, just one, very one quick one for, for Dana. Um, this is coming up a lot now about when you've got quality, you know, when you've got good reliability, the scorecard shows modules uh, with uh, that give a clean sweep uh, in your testing. Are we looking at a period when, instead of lifetime expectancy of modules is the standard sort of twenty-five years? Are we able to be able to push some of this to say forty years? What, what's your view on that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, um, and this gets back to a few things that we've seen uh, in the questions here on the, on the chat, but I think the, the, the premise here comes back to how are those modules actually uh, performing during those tests? And, um, you know, you can't just pass versus not pass uh, like the IEC standards. Uh, you really have to take a look and understand um, what the degradation is, um, how statistically significant this is, um, and uh, really kind of get into um, uh, manufacturing quality and uh, the, is the bomb being disclosed and, and controlled as well. Uh, because as, as Tristan said, these, these things play a, a large role in, uh, in determining the, the quality as well. Um, but these are yeah these are considerations that uh, we are discussing and uh, and working with customers on every day and eager to engage there excellent i think i've got a question for uh, both of you uh, tristan and dana really relates to uh, a group of questions that come through on the uh, pan files so maybe to start give you both the opportunity to sort of explain you know, how is the PAM performance validated, uh, you know, against sort of actual module performance uh, and really give a, uh, an understanding of, you know, why was PAN added as a top performer category? There's a third question in there. Um, just wanting to understand, was there any major uh, performance issues or differences between, say, an OEM or a third-party module from identified in the pan files if uh, Trist uh, Tristan yeah, sure. would first, yeah Thank, thanks Mark um, so we added this category for for pan files to the top performers because as we all know energy yield predictions factor heavily into procurement decisions as well as the cost of capital calculations and and risk assessments um, when we interviewed our or or sent a survey to our downstream partners, uh, a while ago, they voted PAN as the most useful category in the PQP as an initial step in determining which modules to consider. Um, so we thought making that data more, more public as part of the top performer uh, categories was necessary. 
in terms of your other question about OEM versus manu uh, modules at the same from the, the manufacturer's own facility, I don't recall seeing um, strong indicators of one or the other. I would have to go back through the data. So wh whoever asked that, if they want to get in touch, I can I can look through the data and provide a, a, a better answer. Uh, we have seen differences in other tests, and we highlight that in the scorecard. Uh, in one case, the damp heat results from the manufacturer's own facility were much better than the damp heat results from the OEM manufacturers. Not to say that all OEM manufacturers have poor damp heat results and all man manufacturers in their own facility have good results, but in that case, we saw that an identical bomb at, at two different locations had had very different results. I'm not sure if we've seen that in for pan files. And I believe there was a other facet to that question that I have forgotten. So uh, if you yeah, can- Yeah, it, it's, it's actually related to how- uh, Oh, how we validate, the, right, right. Yeah, how the pan performance is validated against uh, an actual module's performance. Right, so as part of um, the PQP, as as you saw on the, the slide, where I show the whole test plan, um, one of the tests is a one-year field exposure study. And with that, we can look at how the module performs in different, different weather conditions, different irradiances and temperatures, and use that data to validate the, the pan performance and, and get higher confidence that the lab-based measurements for the pan indoor lab matches our our high resolution data outdoors from the field exposure test lake. I guess, uh, Dana, uh, you know, how important really is uh, using uh, pan files to you, to the company? Yeah, pan files are an integral part of uh, the work we do every day to, to evaluate and, and uh, verify the output of, of any given plant. The energy output obviously is uh, really predicated on, on what those pan files uh, say. These are things that uh, we review every one of those that we use in, um, in our energy assessments and uh, generally speaking, go through and uh, tailor those to make sure that they are most accurate and consistent as well. Excellent. Uh, there's uh, a lot here as well, further, further stuff on uh, the anti, uh, or uh, literally the, uh, the issue with PID, especially with uh, bifacial modules. Uh, a good one here is uh, how can you, how can you, how can the sort of the rear side degradation be substantially more than the front side, given the front and the rear side uh, productions, you know, it comes from the same cell. Perhaps uh, you want to uh, give some more insight in that, uh, that one, Tristan. Sure. So um, maybe just as a bit of a background for our bi, Bifacial modules, we flash test the front and the rear side of the module at standard test conditions um, before and after light soaking, which before all of our test sequences, there's a, a light soaking to stabilize the module for LID. And then at the end of the at the end of the stress test. So before and after PID, before and after TC, before and after damp heat. So we can see how the performance is being affected on the front and rear side. And what we've seen is some of the issues affect the bulk of the cell. Think of it as the the inner part of the cell. So that affects both the front side and rear side. But other issues will are surface related defects and they'll only impact perhaps the front side or perhaps the rear side. So what we're seeing in our PID, which is one of the surface related issues, is that there's this polarization effect, um, you know, kind of like a static charge to oversimplify it on the rear side of, of the cells that's causing high amounts of degradation on some, not all, but on some bifacial modules. And it's it's both glass glass and glass back sheet. Um, in some cases, we've seen some great results from some manufacturers with their bifacial modules on the on the front and rear side, but on others we see this high amount of degradation. And it's it's not yet clear if that's um, a field related issue 
there, there is some research to show that that polarization effect is reversible and won't happen in the field. Uh, but as I said, we do see it on some modules and, and not on others. So we definitely need to um, you know, consider that and also have more research as an industry to see exactly what's going on there. But certainly um, with our various tests, the, you, know, you, you can't always expect the same amount of degradation on the front and rear side. Okay, understood. I think uh, leading on to there, um, obviously there are uh, companies that market the fact that uh, they are, they're anti-PID. Uh, and there's a good question here, you know, that is trying to understand, uh, you know, lowering the PID uh, obviously exists, but what's, you know, does the scorecard, you know, uh, do any specific analysis for or modules that are claiming to be anti-PID? Yeah, so we we tested modules that are claiming to be anti anti PID and others that aren't, um, and sometimes we find that those claims hold up, and other times we find that they they don't. And you know, with with the amount of the the median degradation in our PID results this year being higher than any previous years, it's obviously a, a concern, and it's you know, it's not a solved problem, as I, I mentioned earlier. So I think, I, I think it's really important to drill down to the bomb level and see how the bomb is performing because that, you know, that same module type can have a different bill of materials and still have the same data sheet and the same power la label and can have very different test results. Um, whether it's for PID or for some of these other tests. So, you you know, you really have to contact PVAL, get access to the full reports and understand which bill of materials performed, performed well. And, you know, the old adage, trust but verify. If, if the data sheet says anti-PID, we've seen enough uh, examples where that's not necessarily the case that, that you need to verify those claims. Okay, understood. Uh, this one's a little bit different. I think it's interesting um, uh, for you uh, here, uh, uh, Tristan. Have you tested any modules with embedded maximum PowerPoint tracking technology, uh, the integrated circuit size? Have, have you made any special accommodations to test these types of, this type of module? Not, we, we've done testing on integrated into the junction box. Uh, is that what they mean? Because there used to be a product where it was actually in integrated into the laminate, and I think that that no longer exists. But anyway, we have yeah we have done PQPs on on modules with integrated electronics. Um, here's a good time to shout out our inverter PQP. So whether it's an AC module or a DC optimized module, um, we do inverter and electronics testing on the electronics and we do module testing on the DC module and then some of the tests, those two are combined to show the module performance with the integrated electronics. And yeah, we've done those, those projects. Okay, great. Uh, I've got a question here for, for Dana. The, the, companies, the person was looking at one of the slides where you, you're focusing on uh, the idea that 50% of standard modules are predicted to you know, need replacement uh, in year 30. So could you explain uh, the difference between standard and the quality modules and also the data that goes into these numbers uh, for the years 20 to 30? Yeah, this basically comes down to a lot of what's been discussed here, some of which is whether or not there is a warranty um, or a third-party warranty. Um, um, quality modules generally would have, uh, you know, as, as we would kind of classify it, uh, a good warranty behind that. And then on top of that, it comes back as well to whether or not those modules are passing standard IEC testing um, versus um, PQP testing, as we've described here. So quality modules, in this case, would have had extended duration testing similar to the PQP with um, a minimal amount of uh, degradation. Um, and then there's, there's other things along this line, too, in terms of differentiating between quality and high durability. A lot of that comes into um, the bomb itself, uh, how that's being controlled. Um, 
uh, manufacturing uh, quality and, and audits uh, for the, the manufacturing lines that are being used to produce those modules. And then on top of that, the extent of the degradation after accelerated testing. So I hope that gives some context. Obviously, reach out to us. We're happy to engage and, and discuss this in more detail. And uh, it's constantly evolving as we continue to get more uh, test data and field data as well. Uh, thank you for that, Dana. Um, now, I, I can uh, relate to this question uh, very well. It's uh, regarding, uh, obviously, the, the rapid introduction of new PV modules. We're talking, you mentioned, Tristan, about the wafer sizes, they're getting bigger, you're getting bifacial, uh, there's N-type, there's P-type. Uh, trust me, as a, as a journalist that writes product reviews, um, uh, I, I truly resonate with uh, this person's uh, uh, question, which is, is third-party third testing keeping up with the rapid introduction of new modules? I'm finding up to about a six-month delay, which impacts our due diligence reporting. Yeah, great, great question, and I understand um, the difficulties, Mark, in, in keeping up with uh, all these new product releases. So we work closely with the, the module manufacturers on their product roadmaps, and we get you know samples early on in in the in the product being ready for mass production. As you can imagine, some of these products are released. Um, months if not years in advance of mass production you know I'm, if you've been to a solar conference you probably saw bifacial modules five years ago before they were they were really ready for prime time if you will so we work with manufacturers to to get those samples early on in their life cycle to try to shorten that time but i agree it's with these new announcements coming out every four to six months and new new cell sizes and changing um, you know how the module is the the cells are soldered together or, or interconnected um, those type of things it's there's there's really significant changes happening on a quarterly basis if not if not faster um, and so we're doing doing our best to keep up with the the manufacturers and and a lot of those manufacturers realize that PQP testing is a gate to selling those products. And so they want to work with us to get those samples as soon as possible. So they have the data that, you know, DMVGL as IEs need to approve those purchases and, and approve the financing of those, those pro projects using those products. Yeah, I'll just I'll just concur with Tristan here. I mean, this is uh, you know a, a balance that that we're all fighting. Obviously, in terms of new products coming out all the time, manufacturers want to to demonstrate the bankability of these as well. And I think um, I I can't stress enough you know the the value of having good and representative data on on these new technologies. Um, obviously, with new technologies, potentially come new degradation mechanisms. And so, you know, to some extent, it's about keeping the testing scenarios and, and our diligence um, ahead of that as well, uh, because most of the IC tests are all there to uh, reproduce uh, failures or degradation mechanisms that are occurring in the field or have been observed in the field previously. So it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg at, at a time, and that's where I think it's invaluable to have a very diverse um, testing protocol um, along the lines of um, you know, PVEL's PQP here to be able to assess you know, product quality and understand what the implications are for the lifetime of your systems. Thank you for that, Dana. Um, looking at the time, uh, thank you, Tristan. Thank you, Dana, uh, for your... Uh, work on this. I think it's uh, been a, a lot of fantastic information. Thank you as well to the attendees. We, you've given us some really good questions. Uh, regrettably, I can see more questions than we can get to, but I know that uh, uh, both uh, DNV and uh, PV Labs are more than happy to, to contact you guys afterwards. Uh, but uh, thank you all for attending, and uh, this is the end of uh, this Tech Talk webinar. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Thank you.